I'm Leo Walter for Kick Guru. This is Leo Says, first week of November 2017. As I'm sure you're aware, I spend my time at Kick Guru doing reviews, laptops, motherboards, cases, all sorts of hardware. And when I do those reviews, I end up with a series of questions. I have to answer the questions before I can do the review. Who's it meant for? Is it expensive? Is it any good? What's going on? Who am I? Where am I? Why am I? around and around endless questions then hopefully we get some information we get a few answers and we can deliver a review it's all good stuff uh, so in preparation for this leo says i wrote down some sort of notes to myself which end up being more questions first item on the list nvidia gtx 1070 ti recently launched uh, dominic did the review uh, he reviewed two different gtx 1070 ti's i don't quite understand why gtx 1070 ti exists more accurate, I don't understand why it exists alongside GTX 1080, because the two products have so much in common, they're priced at such a similar price point. Uh, there is, of course, the bigger thing about NVIDIA uh, having crushing domination in the world of graphics over AMD at the moment. That's, that's just a given, uh, which essentially means NVIDIA can do anything that it likes. But nonetheless, this slicing up the product stack uh, such that 1070 Ti arrives and it's got very carefully chosen number of shaders and clock speeds and uh, what NVIDIA has allowed its partners to do, or rather hasn't allowed its partners to do with overclocking. So you cannot buy a 1070 Ti from EVGA, for example, that is overclocked out of the factory. You're relying on their uh, GP, uh, GPU boost for uh, extra performance. So the quality of the cooler does make a difference uh, and how they've made the hardware and, and the power and such like power delivery, that all counts. But out of the factory, these cards all arrive at the same clock speeds. Some manufacturers are working to allow you to kind of a one click overclock them. Uh, so you get the equivalent of a you know super clock for the win or whatever it might be. But when you receive the thing, it's just a GTX 1070 Ti. And that's slightly annoying, but it would appear that NVIDIA has done it to make sure that the 1070 Ti doesn't take the market off the slightly more expensive 1080. Okay, fair enough, kind of. Obviously, the reason NVIDIA is doing this is because it can, but nonetheless, I don't quite see why they decided to bring in a product that's 50 quid cheaper than the frankly far too expensive 1080. Uh, the Technically, it is interesting to see that 1070 Ti uses GDDR5 rather than 5X, and it appears to get away with it. Uh, 5X doesn't appear to be absolutely essential, so that extra technology and presumably extra expense is not a requirement to get decent gaming performance. But the two products are in the great scheme of things so blooming similar you think either one would live or the other but not both alongside each other. And really I'm thinking to myself well kill the 1080 but why would Nvidia? They've been cranking those things out. It's a stopgap graphics card that's intended to last for a few months. It must I don't know how much it's made them over the last year but it must have made them a fortune. So fair play Nvidia Okie dokie, but why now the 1070 Ti? Is it so they don't like they're resting on their laurels? Possibly so. It is, to my mind, however, slightly depressing. Nvidia can bring out 1070 Ti and slice the product stack that bit more finely. Uh, you'd have to say it's been targeted just to kill off Vega 56, uh, and in that sense, I'd say it's done a proper job. But realistically, the launch of Vega 5664 was so blooming disappointing. Uh, the information, the pricing, the availability that came out immediately after launch, that I don't think NVIDIA really needed to drive that final nail in that particular coffin. Uh, Vega 56, 1070 Ti, well, okay. However, why 1070 Ti and 1080? That question remains. The other slightly depressing point about it is that it implies we can forget about NVIDIA bringing out Volta anytime soon. Volta's been ready for Gould does how long now. They haven't needed to bring it out because they've got no reason to. Pascal's doing a very nice job, thank you. Uh, why bring out Volta when there's absolutely no need, new technology, new expense, lower yields and all the rest of it, refine Pascal. This will make, well, we know this. this, this makes sense. But the fact they can bring out 1070 Ti suggests that they can just do whatever the heck they like and they are. So I'm depressed by that. It's also not very good for gamers, but personally I'm depressed by it. There is a, another curiosity that's just been announced, which is a Titan Collector's Edition. Now there are two, we know next to nothing about Titan Collector's Edition. There's this sort of teaser video that lasts but a few seconds and tells you next to nothing, except it implies there's some sort of RGB coloring going on. So there are two possibilities here, given the Titan, Titan XP and Titan thing we've had going on, three Titans so far in the current range. It is possible that Titan 
collector's edition is simply a Titan XP with some coloured or RGB lighting, in which case that would be just awful. I mean, if NVIDIA can bring that out and sell it for a thousand pounds or twelve hundred pounds, that would just be jumping the shark big time. Possible, you have to hope to goodness not true. The optimistic view is, and I'm, I'm gonna, the optimistic view is that Titan Collector's Edition might be Volta, might. I have no reason to think I'm hoping that's what it is. If it isn't, if it's just some trivial refresh of the existing Titans, then God help us all. So we will have to wait and see what happens there. If it's Volta, then thank goodness, like a glacier, the graphics business is moving on. I was playing uh, Far Cry 4 this morning at 4K. My processor was sitting there at 25%. It's an 8-core Core i7. My 1080 Ti was uh, thrashing its backside off. So more graphics power. I want more graphics power. Not at £1,200, thank you very much. But we do need more graphics. If Volta is going to take us forward, Bring it on, please bring it on. Moving down the list, a uh, conversation we had actually when we were out at ASRock about uh, Dominic, myself, and uh, our man Anjay visited ASRock a week back. Uh, we were talking about overclocking. Uh, ASRock uh, brought up that uh, they, they actually aren't mad keen on the emphasis placed in reviews on motherboards uh, about overclocking, uh, overclocking CPUs, obviously. Which surprised us because it's a feature that every motherboard manufacturer dwells on unless it's a real low-end, cheaper motherboard. And their point was that not many people overclock. They reckon about, I believe the figure was one-sixth of their customers overclock. Uh, many will try it a little bit and then not bother. Uh, so it is a feature of passing interest to the vast majority of the buying public. Uh, with enthusiast publications such as Kit Guru. clearly it is of more interest, but our research tells us that it is a percentage of the audience rather than the entire audience. Uh, and I'd be interested to know what percentage of the audience goes for auto overclocking rather than the full manual thing, you know, changing voltages and base clocks and multipliers and all the rest of it. Uh, I, I don't count XMP in this. XMP is just a given. If you're not enabling XMP, it's free, you should do it. Uh, but overclocking the CPU, it's a trade-off. You know, extra heat, more power, uh, shorter life potentially of components, the hassle factor and so on and so forth. Uh, against what you get in return. So it, it requires a bit of work. Personally, recently, I've been quite taken by all the auto overclocking features in motherboards. Uh, with X299 for sure, uh, not Threadripper, we Coffee Lake. Uh, Coffee Lake was the one where it was just hit a button, job done, bang, extra performance. Easiest overclock in my life, absolutely amazing. But having said that, I've been recently doing some Threadripper work. Uh, it wasn't exactly auto overclocking, but it was go in the BIOS, change the multiplier to 40, change the uh, CPU voltage to 1.4 volts, enable XMP, done, bang. Now that's not exactly auto overclocking, you have to have some familiarity with the UEFI, but it would take 30 seconds of tuition to teach a chimpanzee to do it. Uh, so that to me is about as good as it gets. And I noticed in a, a review, I did a couple of reviews actually recently in Motherboards, uh, comments on YouTube were, oh, no, you don't want to do that. You don't do auto over, you want manual overclocking. It's like, well, if it works, why? Why do I want the hassle? If I'm leaning on the bias writers at these motherboard manufacturers, and these days in the UK, there are so few motherboard manufacturers still in existence. The smaller companies have, you know, drifted away, your jetways and your DFIs and such like. Uh, the, the companies that remain, uh, there are four big ones, uh, ASUS, MSI, Gigabyte, and ASRock, and you've got to include EVGA in there as well as the sort of the fifth extra. But those companies are not idiots. Uh, and I don't feel that leaning on the bias writers and, and what they've done is uh, in any way, shape, or form a bad thing. I mean, either it works or it doesn't. If it doesn't, you pretty soon work out that things are either unstable or it draws an ungodly amount of power and the process is as hot as hell. Uh, so once you figure that out, well, you either go for it or you don't. Generally speaking, you overclock as far as you feel comfortable, pull it back a bit for reliability and keep the temperature something sensible, avoid doom, death and drama, make sure the alarms are enabled, make sure the fans are working, job done, what's not to like. Uh, so the auto overclocking, I, in the past I was in two minds about it, I'm becoming much, much happier with the idea because it seems to work so well. And I haven't seen a truly bad BIOS, although I've read one or two people's complaints about certain features of certain BIOS is in the plural. Uh, but I personally haven't suffered any nasties recently, which is an absolute pleasure to report. 
In terms of last years, however, we have had some disappointment with cases. Uh, there's been this trend with cases, you know, towards the tempered glass and the RGB lighting and such like, and then the packing in the extras. And there have been recently uh, two particular misses in the case business, uh, both unfortunately from Cooler Master, the H500 and the C700. I reviewed the uh, C700, Dominic did the H500. Neither of them worked particularly well. They both had things you could like and admire and you could see what they'd done and then you could see how they'd gone wrong. But in both cases, there were faults that really shouldn't have uh, got past the here's the sample, let's build a PC into it and see what happens stage. Uh, things like airflow and such like in some instances is just peculiar. You know, if you're trying to flow air and through slots in the side of the front panel which are hitting the side of the intake fan rather than the air coming in in front of the fan and going through the fan, well, that's obviously a problem. If you pick a case up and bits fall off, that's a problem. If you invert a motherboard tray or some such and then you end up with a bit left over and various screws that you can't put in places on, that's a problem and so on and so on and so on. Uh, I'm not against, in. I, I like glass and I like RGB. However, a case primarily and fundamentally has to support your components, work correctly and also flow enough air to keep the thing cool. But I do also like it to be quiet. Uh, so fundamentally it needs to be a case that works that filters the air that does a proper job and if you then dress it up with some extras that's all to the good we have a review of the nzxt uh, 700 coming up soon on kit guru which includes their fan and lighting controllers uh, newest versions of i'll be interested to see how that works it certainly looks the part uh, but uh, it needs to also deliver and it's not and it's an expensive case because it includes a bunch of extras. And that uh, is, has become a theme. Uh, take a case that should be 80 or 100 pounds, add on some extra bits and pieces such as glass that makes it you know, more 125, possibly even 150 pounds. And then you add in some extra, extra features and suddenly you're up to the 200 and 250 pounds. And there comes a point where you think, no, no, you case manufacturers, you've lost your way. Pull it back, look at what you're doing. Yes, you're supporting a motherboard that's 300 pounds or even 500 pounds. You're supporting a processor that potentially is 2,000 pounds. You're supporting memory that costs fortunes. It's not unreasonable for somebody to spend a lot of money on a case, provided the case does a decent job. And we have recently seen some cases that do not do a decent job. We've also seen other cases from companies like Game Max, for example, surprisingly cheap cases do a perfectly good job. And the case manufacturer I return to time and again because they keep bringing out new models, Fantex, who seem to set a, a regular standard for how cheap can a case be and be sensible. I'm taking the elite out of the uh, equation because that's monstrously expensive. But uh, Fantex delivers plenty of cases that are very sensibly priced. Corsair delivers a colossal endless array of cases every single segment of the market is hit uh, they do a very fine job but when you see something like the cooler master c700 or the h500 arrive after a gestation period of a year or more it seems and then there are fundamental things that have gone wrong uh, the question i ask myself going back to that question is did someone actually build a pc into this case and if they didn't why not and if they did what did they think you do have to sometimes wonder exactly where things went off the rails uh, and then why they didn't stop and reappraise the situation. So I am crossing my fingers that NZXT H700 uh, is the business. Uh, only time will tell, but hopefully we'll see that quite soon. Oh yes, good news. I'm off to CES in 2018, second week of January. Uh, I haven't been to CES before. I've uh, done Computex a few times now. CES, that'll be my first. CES has become more and more important in the world of PCs. It's a consumer electronics show. Uh, it stood originally for sort of gadgets and TVs and such like, but it's become much more PC oriented. And one of the things I really hope I get to see there is Ryzen Mobile, a proper APU with both uh, Ryzen uh, CPU cores, but also Vega graphics. Uh, I don't know whether it will be on show there. I'm sincerely hoping it will, because that APU now seems to me to be well overdue and the mobile uh, market is uh, open and waiting. As to whether that APU with Vega graphics will be able to work correctly on battery, give decent performance while giving decent battery life, that is the, well, this is, I was going to say burning question, but that implies hot. So bit undiplomatic really but you know what I mean that's the question I've been asking ever since uh, we saw it on the roadmap which is that APU is required for laptops we want that hardware to arrive sooner rather than later and to work correctly to take on the 
Intel Nvidia combo that we see in so many laptops. You've no idea how dull it can get for a reviewer seeing the same hardware over and again uh, when the detailed differences between one laptop and the next can sometimes come down to daft little differences like RGB keyboards. I'm really hoping I get to see Ryzen Mobile with Vega graphics at CES. Uh, if it's not there, that would be a bitter disappointment. If it is there and it works correctly, um, believe you me, if I see it, I want to take a proper look at it rather than just walk past the booth and walk away. But uh, only time will tell. On the time front, uh, Intel Coffee Lake. Coffee Lake. Goodness me, didn't Intel do a good job of sticking the knife in the back of AMD? So we've got six cores that work well, that go real fast. Here's the performance. That stymies uh, Ryzen 5, or at least puts the hold on. I mean, it killed KB Lake uh, Core i5. Absolutely killed it. And it makes the Core i7 look a bit of a peculiar thing. But it's really put the block on AMD for the moment because you stop and go, whoa, whoa, let's just wait a moment. Buying decision time. Got to wait and see if it's worth doing. And that was obviously exactly what they intended. Uh, and you can understand why. But it's like announce. I mean, when are we going to see actual units of Coffee Lake on sale? It's still TBA. Uh, it was always intended, we understood, for CES, so the first week, second week of January. It's now feeling as though that's when the stock is actually going to arrive. They just announced it months early just to get the, get the drop on AMD. So, if so, dirty pool. But we shall see when it eventually comes truly to market. But right now, oh, that was a paper launch to end all paper launches. Good product, but if you can't buy it for months rather than weeks, that's just getting a little bit beyond the pale. Uh, other things I've seen recently that sound interesting. The Razer phone. Um, it's £699 in the UK, £699, Euros, dollars Euros, pounds is all the same. Uh, a gaming phone. I'm not quite clear what a gaming phone is. Clearly a phone on which you play games, what kind of games. And the big thing about it being this 120Hz screen, but it's a variable refresh rate. So it doesn't have to run at 120Hz. It can run up to 120Hz. That's a major technical feature. The pricing of the £699, which to my mind is a lot of money and which Razer says is average for high-end uh, uh, phones, both Apple and Android. Well, yeah, kind of. But to my mind, once you get past, say, £300, you're into expensive territory. Whether it's £500, £700 or £1,000, it's expensive. That depends if you're actually shelling out the cash yourself, of course, or going on contract. But if you want to have the thing unlocked, you need to buy it direct, in which case you're paying full price. If you want it uh, on contract, you're getting it locked. Is it three, the network? I believe it's three. Uh, so I'm, I'm not convinced that the Razer phone is exactly a completely new thing. It is an Android phone that looks the part that appears to have a huge battery, which has a very interesting screen and a, a fairly painful price. Uh, it is bold of Razer to be taking on the likes of Samsung and Google, I mean, a Pixel, obviously, uh, and then LG. Very, very bold indeed. Razer's done some really good stuff. If they can pull this off, well, fair play to them. Uh, but that is, that's almost putting all your chips on the poker table that is i'm i'm impressed by that fingers crossed it works for them i have no idea how that one's going to pan out but we'll again we'll find out sooner rather than later moving down the list and getting back to pcs and such like amd threadripper pcs where are the threadripper pcs threadripper launched a long time ago now and i've yet to see uh, a system manufacturer pushing threadripper saying here's our pc review it we get it with new Intel and such like, we get it all the while. Here's the new thing. Have a, we've seen various Ryzen 7 PCs. We've seen Ryzen 5. Uh, Threadripper, none. Not one has been offered that I'm aware of anyway. Uh, and when you look around the manufacturers, you find a Threadripper PC for sale. Obviously, it won't be cheap because the processor is not cheap and you need all the DDR4 and the motherboard and so on and so forth. So you're looking at an uh, expensive PC, but it can do gaming and workstation and such like. I haven't seen any. And also, while I'm uh, carping and moaning, SSD capacity and prices, it's just been fixed. It's absolutely stagnant. If you buy a high-end NVMe M.2, a terabyte will cost you about 500 pounds, two terabytes, a thousand pounds. If you want more than that, uh, they are available, but not really. So a thousand pounds for two terabytes of SSD, ouch. If you go for SATA, two and a half inch, 300 pounds for a terabyte, and 600 pounds for two terabytes, obviously not as fast as NVMe. That really grates. 
there's been so much movement in the industry with flash memory and such like in the manufacturers and who owns what you know who owns Toshiba today what's Western Digital up to it's taking far longer than I expected to see the progress I expected to see the roadmap I expected was a doubling of capacity at sensible prices every year so by now I expect to be buying a four terabyte SSD for sensible money or a two terabyte cheaply next year I wanted eight terabytes expensive and four terabytes cheap and so on and so on and so on it's not happening meanwhile ironically the hard drive manufacturers are moving things on you you can buy a 12 terabyte hard drive now for reasonably sensible money kind of uh, so the delta between SSDs and hard drives it's not closing that is not what I expected to see uh, so SSD prices yeah I'd like them to come down but I want the capacities to go up I want the option of having an all solid state system peculiar so we've had a really busy 2017 so far loads of new products and yet I find myself endlessly saying well where's the things I'm actually waiting for where is Volta in particular where are the Threadripper PCs? Where are those cheap SSDs with massive capacity? I'm waiting and waiting, and tragically, I'm not a patient man, and I'm getting more irritated by the day. This is Leo Says. I'm Leo Wood for Kit Guru. If you like this video, thumbs up. If you don't, thumbs down. If you want more from Kit Guru, do click to subscribe.